Howdy, y'all. Welcome to the very last session for today, the one that everyone really wants to be at lunch, uh, dinner to already, and uh, I don't blame them for leaving. Uh, so we're going to talk about media, ads, and performance today, uh, and uh, it's a Vox story. Uh, so hi, I'm Ian Carico. I'm a web performance artist at Vox Media. Uh, you can find me online at I am Carico uh, on Twitter, GitHub, Drupal, uh, IRC, my website, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, also, this presentation was half written by Jason Ormond. He is the other uh, performance engineer at Vox Media. Um, he is OCOR all across the internet. Um, and he is actually on paternity leave right now, so we're all hoping for the best. Um, so what is this presentation going to be about? Uh, this presentation is all about two performance devs working on a legacy code base. Uh, we have a uh, code base that's been around for a very long time, the core CMS, uh, that we have been charged with making uh, the entire uh, site more performance, or all of our sites more performant. Um, it's practical tips on what we have altered to make the site more performance and what we've done to uh, enhance performance across all of our verticals as well as some overarching lessons that we've learned uh, in this venture. Uh, I kind of want this to be a, a frank discussion of uh, the successes and failures that we have had, um, as well as uh, kind of what we've taken across. A lot of performance talks, including all of mine in the past, have been based on the idea that, uh, you know, when you're starting anew, you can have performance budgets, and when you're doing a redesign, you can do this or that. Uh, we don't have that uh, ability anymore, uh, and a lot of people and a lot of sites don't because we have code that we're going to be stuck with whether we want it or not. So uh, let's first talk about the constraints that we, uh, we faced when we were uh, working on performance. The first is that we could not do a redesign. Uh, we have a bunch of different sites, and while occasionally we do do redesign for sites, we have not the ability to start from the ground up, uh, migrate to a new system, or to... Uh, you know, start everything from scratch. We have uh, a huge amount of users and a huge amount of sites that need uh, constant attention and we can't just stop supporting them for some way, shape, or form. Um, we have eight verticals. So uh, we run Vox.com, SP Nation, Curbed, Racked, Eater, uh, The Verge, Polygon, and Recode uh, are all eight of our sites. Uh, anything that we do needs to work for all of them. Uh, we can't uh, easily single out a single site and say well, we're just going to work on performance of this, we need to work on performance on all of them. So at any point in time when we release code, we're releasing it to all of those sites for the most part. Um, and finally, we have advertising. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people use ads in their uh, sites. Our uh, business is primarily advertising driven, uh, so we don't have the option of just saying, oh, no ads. There will be a few accountants coming at my door wondering what I just did if I chose to do that. Um, so we have our, our money pixels that bring in uh, all of the money for the... I'm going to screw up. I don't know what time it is. Hey. There we go. So our plan. Uh, we, we stepped in and we started uh, almost a year ago. Actually, just over a year ago. So we started April in 2015 and sat down and made a plan on how we want to uh, go and attack performance for all of our sites. Uh, we decided to uh, kind of do a triage, as, as you would in many different situations. So we start with the big ones. We start with the things that uh, we felt we could make a quick impact uh, and something that could easily you know, show uh, both the higher ups and other devs you know, the impact of what the performance team can really do. Um, and that started off with images. Uh, redoing how we work with images across all of our sites, uh, how we do fonts across most of our sites. Um, and then after that, we went to the more time-consuming options, the ones that we knew were going to take uh, a bit more time, a bit more finagling, more work with other teams uh, within the organization. So things like ad calls, uh, where we had to work with all of our revenue team, all of our sales team, all of our um, design developers on many different fronts. Uh, more image work. There's always more image work to be done uh, that will take a bit more uh, finessing. Um, and also updating our JavaScript and how that is being run. So we're going to start with images. Uh, I'm going to just let you roll in right now. I did not do any of the image work on our sites. This is actually all Jason Orman's work. Um, 
And if you're interested in learning more about this, again, his Twitter handle is Okor, uh, and he has gone deeper into images than I knew was possibly available. Um, however, at first, we, uh, we looked at the delivery of our images um, and the different ways you can do that. Um, so the primary methods that you can send off images to a site, you have a regular IMG tag, uh, which we use for a lot of things. You can use lazy loading or JavaScript where you uh, load it as it comes to a viewport, or you can load it after the page load happens, uh, but something where you pull that image in with JavaScript after the initial load. Or you can use the picture element, um, which allows for various different sizes or types to be pushed uh, forward to the front end, depending on your viewport and a bunch of other various variables. Uh, and we use, uh, I'll go back here, we actually use a little bit of all three of these depending on the type of image and where the image is and why we're doing that, which we'll get to in a little bit. Um, but we also want to make sure that the images that we're sending to the user are the best user, uh, the best images for that user's browser, for the user's screen, et cetera. Um, we have opted to do a lot of real-time processing, so almost every image you will see on any Vox property has been uh, sent to a server, resized, and reformatted to be right for your screen or screens very similar to yours. Um, so there are a couple options doing this. You can use software as a service. There are some things that do this for you. Uh, we use an open source project uh, that we run on our own servers to uh, resize, reformat a bunch of images. Uh, you could also, in theory, do pre-processing um, and have images as they get uploaded to the server, your editorial team puts it up there, then it just creates a bunch of images uh, on the server and sends those up. Uh, we don't do this because we have hundreds and hundreds of articles going up every day, thousands of images getting processed every day, and most of our articles uh, get looked at within the first 48 uh, hours. So we don't want a, a huge amount of images stored on a server that won't be used past the first week or so. Um, so, nope. <laughs> Uh, so the, the open source s solution we've been using is Thumbbore. Um, this has turned out to be amazing. Uh, we can send off uh, different sizes uh, through any singular image, uh, different formats. Uh, we're working right now on, uh, I think he's doing JPEG 2000 uh, support for this and making sure we can get uh, that for some browsers. Um, the cool thing that Thumbbore can do is uh, it can send off either a WebP or a non-WebP version, depending on if the browser supports it. So this is kind of the before and after. The uh, left is loading the Verge homepage without WebP on mobile, uh, 3G. The right is loading it with WebP. Uh, as you can see, we save, you know, 24 seconds of load time just from loading WebP images. Um, and Thumbboard does all of that work for us. Uh, we do a little bit of script on the front end to confirm whether or not a browser can use WebP, but that's it. Everything else is done completely by Thumbbore to deliver smaller, faster, more efficient images to our users. I like how you can hear my straw. In the, this is a very hot mic. Uh, and then we also looked at the, the timing of our images, um, how uh, how each and every image loads and when that happens within our load order. Um, so we want to load our critical images first. We want to load uh, the logo. Uh, so the logo is usually an IMG tag. Uh, we want to load uh, the hero images as fast as possible. The hero images are usually uh, picture elements because that is handled by the browser and sent off immediately. Um, and then uh, secondary images are delayed. So things that, uh, images within articles. Uh, are all lazy loaded. Those are done by JavaScript when you're close to the viewport. So that, one, we don't load extra images that users aren't going to see if they don't scroll down all the way. Uh, and two, we don't accidentally have a image that's further down, possibly halting an image further up that we want, uh, definitely want a user to see. Uh, and then we also use a pre uh, the preloader uh, meta tag to connect to the right subdomains for our images so that uh, when a user comes to the page, already a connection is being made to that server so that we know those images will definitely be downloading as soon as possible. And that's just a, a meta tag in the head. Um, 
So just altering the timing on SB Nation, uh, again, the left is before, right is after, but we save uh, visually for that first paint. Uh, let's see here, it's six seconds, uh, roughly, more or less. Uh, and it's not stopping the, the, the full page load will still take longer if you're including the images down below, but by lazy loading the images down below, by making sure that we have that preloader, and by making sure that we use picture element uh, and the most important tags uh, showing up on the right side, the user feels like they're having a much faster experience, a much better experience, uh, and it's a whole lot better for UX. Um, yeah. Uh, and this is our first overarching lesson, uh, which is tackle the straightforward issues first. Um, we found this is the best for a couple of reasons. One, uh, we showed the executive team like right off the bat that we're useful, uh, which really helps sell our cause for later work. Uh, they were already on our side in that performance is a good thing, but this is a, a great way of showing them this is exactly why it's a good thing. Um, but also it, it kind of builds up team morale right immediately off the front of, look, we, we can make an impact fairly quickly, uh, so let's, let's hit those ones that uh, images were one of those things that we have so many of them uh, changing a few things around, like using the picture element for the hero images, was fairly straightforward compared to other work um, that we could nail out within a month or so. So the next thing we did is fonts, um, and this is what I uh, did at first. Um, we use Font Face Observer by Bram Stein. Uh, it's a wonderful library that will check to see if fonts are loaded within the browser or not, and alert you uh, if they have. Uh, you can also use the document fonts, uh, the font events already in native browsers. However, we use, uh, I guess we'll get to this in a second, but uh, Font Face Observer uh, is a small little JavaScript library that we send off the fonts that we're loading for a page. It returns back with whether or not they've been loaded uh, with some promises. Um, so we set that up to uh, monitor with whether our fonts are loading on Vox, Eater, and curbed. Uh, we haven't rolled out to some of our other sites because of the uh, fonts uh, forge that we're using uh, doesn't support. It's, they, do, they do things weird. Um, but then we set it up with Google Analytics, um, where we would send off to Google Analytics whether or not fonts loaded on uh, pages or not. And we just sent off a quick event, fonts loaded, fonts failed, uh, or fonts not available. Um, and we looked at the analytics data of, okay, what browsers are uh, failing, which ones are succeeding, and we had about, with just Font Face Observer, I believe it was 95% of the time, fonts were loading fine, there was no issues. Um, but then we used that Google Analytics data, and we, we sent it to uh, Bram Stein, we figured out what browsers were failing the most. Um, and we, we did some debugging with uh, Font Face Observer on some older browsers on how to fix those ones. Um, but also we found out the one that was failing most often past uh, like IE 7, uh, which I don't care about, um, was Google Chrome. Um, oddly enough, that Font Face Observer was failing most in that browser. Uh, so this is where we then figured out, okay, if we're failing most in the most modern browser in this, uh, for reasons that we cannot necessarily ascertain, uh, let's use native font events. So for any modern browser that has native font events, uh, within the browser, we use that first. And then we fall back to Font Face Observer uh, for all of our scripts. Uh, this allows us to load our scripts asynchronously. It allows us to push our font loading further down the, uh, oh, the critical rendering path to make sure that we have content loads first and then fonts get loaded in whenever they're available. Um, and it also allows us to avoid, for the most part, uh, the flash of invisible text uh, where fonts go away and then reappear on your page sometimes. I say for the most part, we have a very minor issue that's popped up on Curbed recently uh, because we have updated some other things. Um, but then we also worked with our design team in every site that we implemented this to have better fallback fonts. Um, I'm sure many people uh, who are used to just fonts loading up on our page immediately because they're part of the critical rendering path don't always look at what the fallback fonts look like and our design team hadn't, uh, because we weren't loading them asynchronously before, like they kind of sort of thought about what they should be, but not what they look like. Uh, but we did a lot of work with them and a lot of QA work to make sure that 
uh, all of our fallback fonts are as close as possible so that the UX uh, jar is as small as possible. Um, and that took coordination between a, a several different design teams because we're working on several different verticals at the time. Um, but the end result is that things like the, uh, the Verge and uh, Eater and Curb and Vox all look pretty good without uh, the design fonts within, uh, with just using the native browser fonts. Um, and as close as possible. Um, the nice thing about font face observer is it will add, we, we set it up to add a class to the body of fonts loaded once it's there. So when that's not there, uh, we can alter the font sizes. We can also, like, it's not just we have a good fallback font, but we can change the size to be a different pixel size, uh, not just changing the fonts, uh, making it so much closer um, for all of our main fonts. Um, and this is the, the next overarching lesson. Uh, we could not have done this font work if we did not have buy-in through not just our team, but design team, editorial. Uh, I actually did have some editorial people freaking out when they heard that fonts might not be there immediately. And then once I explained it to them, they're like, oh, right, that's logical, but editorial people don't like the design or the, the visual aesthetic to be off. Um, design team doesn't like that. But once we have that culture of uh, performance is an important thing. Reaching out to these teams has been uh, so much easier. Uh, and to this day, I have a bunch of key uh, people in various teams that we'll reach out to of like, okay, we want to change this or that, or we want to make, uh, just recently I was talking with uh, editorial teams about forcing HTTPS on our site. And like the buy-in for that is so much easier once you have that culture of this is just as important as design. This is a, a piece of design. So you'll find in huge amounts of talks all over is that culture is something you need to do, and this truly is, in our experience, a, um, an important thing. Uh, also, even with culture on your side, there are still some things that we can't or uh, it's harder for us to do uh, because it's a little too much change, I guess. <laughs> uh, so the next thing we attacked, and this is something I, I just finished uh, a heavy bit of work, uh, actually, last week, Monday, it deployed, uh, is advertising. Uh, our advertising system was built, uh, I forget the original, like for a system pre-DFP uh, that was all synchronous. Uh, so we moved to DFP uh, and before, uh, another team did a lot of work to make sure that DFP could load asynchronous eventually. Uh, so this has been a, a long, heavy bit of work to go from a very synchronous, uh, slow version of loading ads to a more efficient way. Uh, and there's still a bunch of work we, we have yet to do. Um, so first, uh, for ads that we build internally, uh, Vox not only creates content, we also have actually an in-house advertising agency for our, our um, sites, um, that we build sites. We have a bunch of people who are creating ads, uh, and they use templates and systems that we've built uh, internally, but you know, they don't, they're site builders effectively that don't necessarily know, okay, is this a, a performance ad, is this a slow ad, or what have you. So what we did is we have a, a set of a personal web page test server that runs a test on every single ad as it's published. And then the uh, creator of that ad will get uh, what we call our speed rocket, which will be either green, yellow, or red. Uh, green is great, yellow is okay, but could use some improvements, and red is bad. Uh, and what it ends up as is if it's red, then they come to an engineer and say, okay, something's wrong with this ad, can we take a look at it? And sometimes it's, oh, there's some template work that needs to be changed on how the, the ad is working. Sometimes it's, oh, let's just optimize the image a little better. Um, but we use that system for a, an easy way for our site builders to know, is this something that needs to be looked at again, or is it something that's good to go? Um, and generally speaking, most of our ads already were pretty good, and this helped us find the, the little ones. Uh, we also use header bidding. Um, has anyone used header bidding on their sites? It's a relatively new technology. Okay, I'll make this section short then. <laughs> uh, so header bidding is a way for uh, third parties to compete with uh, Google's VFP servers. So it's a way for us to increase our uh, CPM, our, our revenue from ads. But it means that in the header, we are sending off requests to three or four different exchanges. Uh, for ads, so not just DFP, but also other ones. Now the problem with header bidding is you have header scripts that are going off to third parties. 
when this was first started uh, and when it was first added to the page before I was uh, focusing on this, it was all done synchronously. So we have a bunch of header scripts that are just destroying our page performance. And if any single one of those were to fail uh, or their CDN were to fail, then our site would be delayed heavily. Uh, so we have since reworked that uh, a heavy amount to be mostly asynchronous. Um, we have a, like one main script that is synchronous and the rest are all uh, async requests. We set up uh, timers to make sure that uh, if your response time is over such a thing that we just don't care about your, your bids. Uh, and a lot of this is done by uh, Technorati, but we, we have some internal work doing this as well. Um, and we have some more work hopefully coming out soon to make it even better. Um, then also our ad calling. Uh, our ad calling again was synchronous. Uh, so the, the work that we just pushed uh, rewrote our, our entire ad JavaScript from the, the ground up to be instead of uh, one, because it was synchronous and before it was reliant on jQuery, uh, because it was synchronous, uh, there was a bunch of other little mini libraries that we did. We rewrote it so that it could be run entirely independent of any other scripts on the page. Uh, so that all of our JavaScript on certain sites are now completely in the footer, uh, with the exception of our ads JavaScript, which runs inline. I'm not quite sure if it will stay in line. It may move to be something else uh, sooner rather than later. However, having it uh, in line means that we have no uh, internal JavaScript calls in the header uh, until, oh, at all. The only JavaScript calls in the uh, that are being called in the header are all done asynchronously via our abs.js scripts. Um, and our results are, this is one of the, the videos that we shared, uh, before is on the left, after is on the right, uh, but we save about 45% roughly uh, on the start render time uh, on curb. It, it, it's, we're currently just baiting it on curb alone. Um, but as you can see, like we have a much faster site just by moving our scripts to the footer, by loading our ads more efficiently, uh, and kind of stepping back and rethinking how we did it and moving code that was legacy or may not be needed anymore, or might there might be a better way of doing that. Um, now, I, I joke, this is also where you can see we have the, the FOIT, the flash of invisible text is coming back because we have finally made our critical rendering path so small. Now we actually are having some font issues again, so we need to go back and, and improve that a little bit more. Um, but this is the, the, the biggest lesson that uh, I was very appreciative of. For a long time, we were, we were kind of focused on uh, quick result uh, tasks, things that we could show come out. Uh, the entire ability of moving uh, our JavaScript to the footer and rewriting ads came out of allowing the performance team to tackle the projects that we want to tackle. Uh, doing this took about two and a half, three months um, from start to finish. Uh, and it was a specific decision by uh, our managers after us begging and pleading for it was to step back and say, okay, you have all the time in the world. What do you want to do? Uh, and this allowed us to tackle work that uh, other front-end developers have been wanting to do for years. Uh, other teams have been wanting to get done, but allowing a single developer to uh, have that freedom, it allowed us to actually go out and really make a change uh, and very large changes um, that will also actually improve the output for other teams. Uh, there's a, another team that is so excited that we've done this because it will allow them to write JavaScript better. Um, and the last thing we have is testing. <laughs> Is all of this actually working? Uh, our very first meeting of the performance team was actually looking at how to test our sites and how to set up testing across the board. We've looked at a variety of different vendors. We've uh, built some internal tools to do testing uh, and various different ways we can look at to know is the change that we're making actually a good thing or is it something that's not good? Um, we've settled more or less on Speaker. Uh, Speaker allows us to monitor all of our sites uh, it's a wonderful service. I personally love it. Um, because we are a site, we are somewhat unique in that we're looking at not just one site, but uh, I mean, in reality, hundreds of sites, but eight main verticals. It's a little hard to get all of our data um, organized in a logical way, is, uh, but I personally love it. Um, 
but the, the biggest issue is finding the, the signal through the noise. When we have uh, as many third-party scripts as we load between ads and analytics and uh, other targeting systems and stuff, uh, any single one of those things could be causing our site to be faster or slower on a given day. Uh, so we have been working heavily on creating some custom analytics. We use the uh, timing metrics within the browser to know when uh, ads are loading when ads are done finishing, uh, when third-party scripts are done loading, uh, all so that we can find a, a, a signal to know what, where along this, this path are we actually having issues. Uh, where, which, which section of scripts might be uh, causing us slowness, or is it something that we've done, is it something that we just committed, or is it something that's completely out of our control? Um, we've, we, we, I was talking with a friend, I ignore like the entire page load time because that could be altered immensely from just a single ad pinging a server repeatedly. Uh, it's a useless metric when you have as many third-party scripts as we do. But our start render time is something that I, I look at very directly, and that's what I, I look at heavily. Uh, that being said, data is really hard sometimes. Um, it's incredibly important to look at the data. It's incredibly important to make metrics of how you're doing. But uh, looking at straight numbers on a database basis can be very difficult uh, on any site that you're loading anything extraneous. Um, do it, look at it, heavily look at it, um, but recognize that this is a, an issue, especially with uh, media sites that is not solved in any way, shape, or form. It's a, a very, very difficult problem. Um, so that, those are all the, the, the main things I want to say thank you. I, I want to leave some time for, for questions today. Um, but yeah, uh, do we have any uh, any questions, concerns? Anyone working on media sites? We found something interesting. Not supporting what? Define road blocking of ads. Ah. Yeah. Okay. So the, the question is, if we have, um, if we're using DFP in asynchronous mode, do we not support uh, road blocking ads or ads taking over the entire page? We do. Um, and what we end up doing is, if I remember this correctly, uh, we have it in asynchronous mode, but we don't actually run a call to get the ads until all of the ads have been defined uh, completely. Uh, and then once DFP has all the information, then we do a call to actually call the ads. Um, so we, uh, I forget what it's, we're still using single request mode. There it is. Um, and that is something that uh, we have to have on our site um, because those are great ads and they bring in a lot of money. Hi, Matt. Mm-hmm. Constant more. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, no, and that's one thing we don't have uh, infinite scroll in any way to perform. The, the ads that we defined at the beginning uh, that we are in the markup are the only ads that we have. Uh, we've been looking at altering that possibly in the future, uh, but at the moment that's not uh, not a concern that we share. Um, but yeah, I I don't have advice on how to. <laughs> oh. Yeah, that's impressive. <laughs> For devices, uh, so. Repeat. How do we monitor performance for devices? Was the question. Um, trying to get better at that. Uh, so our uh, speed curve will monitor not for different devices, but for different speeds and for different browser windows. Um, so that will at least give us a uh, a view into uh, relative speeds on devices. Um, but actually, for we don't have any standardized testing set for different devices. Uh, something that we do do is we have a device lab and I personally use our sites and I personally use our sites not as someone who wants to use our sites but as someone who travels enough that I will go in different areas with different uh, 
speeds and purposely look at how our, at our sites are just feeling. Um, I'm a huge proponent on data and numbers and making sure that you have quantifiable uh, data behind what's going on. But at the end of the day, none of that matters as much as how your sites actually feel. Um, so using devices is what I personally recommend over strict data. The question was if we've uh, noticed any changes in site usage. So uh, as far as the, uh, the things that we have done for like image and stuff, those were all kind of sp sporadically pushed out. Um, uh, so like one small piece was changed, another small piece was changed. So we didn't notice anything directly because of those. Um, the ads uh, change that we made, we just pushed it last week. And next week, we're going to be sitting down and looking at the data impressions and traffic and things like that. Um, so I can't really answer that question yet. Uh, hopefully, once we have all that data done, then I'll be writing a blog post about it. Um, but we just it, using a, a single week uh, of data isn't enough to know if we're having more uh, or a different type of viewer, um, or if just the latest curved article was really hot that week. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for our programmatic ads, um, we use a system called the Media Trust. Um, and the Media Trust goes through our DFP calls. Um, and they, uh, I, I forget the exact percentage, but they do a, a subsection of our ads. And they run them for uh, not just performance, but a bunch of different metrics. Um, one of the things that drives us most is uh, we had a small stint of ads that would redirect users um, to a different page, which is obviously like just the worst thing on earth. Um, so that they go through and they scan a, a subsection of our ads, and anything that does not meet our performance or other security standards will immediately be rejected um, and uh, disabled from DFP's perspective. Um, and it, I don't know how, how deep that goes into if like that entire publisher will get removed um, or what have you. But yeah, the, we, we are constantly scanning all of our, all of our creatives. Third party creatives. Yes, sir. What are we using to share content? Um, it, what modules? So, this is the fun uh, question I get to answer. We do not use Drupal. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm a reformed Drupal developer, I'm going to say. Uh, I used to do a bunch of Drupal work, but uh, this site is on a Rails. Uh, so we built our own custom CMS uh, many, many moons ago that we're still using called Chorus. Um, and that is a Ruby slash Rails um, thing. Although none of, the, none of the specific work that we uh, or I advocate for is specific to a CMS or any backend language. It can be done with anything. Um, if you have questions on specific modules that can do something like this, all of these guys up in green right here could answer uh, the latest Anything else? Well, hey, thank you all for coming. I'll be around all day, all the rest of the day, and tomorrow if you guys have any more questions or want to come up and talk. Um, also, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't say the slides are at imcco slash mediaperf. Uh, they'll also be on my GitHub in a week or so. I need to um, make sure some backend changes are, are okay. And then uh, the, there's feedback on the, the page uh, for this for um, how well this uh, session went. I'd be happy if you filled that out. Uh, there's a, a short link, but it's also just on the, the New Orleans uh, DrupalCon site. Um, and yeah, it's a presentation by Vox Product. Thank you so much.